Money. We all want it, we all like it, and if we're honest, we all wouldn't mind having a bit more of it. But where does it actually come from? Now, before I continue, I want you to think about it for a second. Where does it actually come from? Sure, once a month, your employer transfers your salary to your bank account from where you use it to go shopping, pay your bills, and maybe save a little bit. You might even withdraw some cash, which in the case of Sweden here is really nice to look at. Um, Take this 20 kroner bill, for example, you've got Astrid Lindgren, Pippi Longstrom, and if you look closely, you can even spot Mr. Nielsen, her little monkey right there. So, where does money come from? Now, you might be wondering, how does money get into circulation? Who decides the quantity of money? And, not trivially, what do we mean when we talk about money? Probably most of you have spent less time in their lifetime pondering these questions than on checking and comparing flights for their last family vacation. However, understanding these questions, especially the role of the central bank and what the central bank can and cannot do, is vital to assess and formulate the right economic policies that can make us all better off. So today I want to shed some light on one of the most important processes in an economy that typically does not get a whole lot of attention. Let's start with the definition of money. While there is no universally agreed upon definition of money, I want to focus on what most people tend to associate with the term money, and that's cash. But mainly it's the deposits that you, firms, and the government have in their bank accounts. Both cash and deposits are called broad money. And the, one of the properties is that they are widely accepted as a method of payment in contrast to stocks or bonds, for example, as anybody will know who has tried to pay for dinner using Apple shares. Uh, nerdy joke, I guess. So, to illustrate the process where broad money comes from, I want to use an example that you all might be familiar with. Let's take Emma and Kelda here. Uh, as you can tell, drawing isn't really my biggest strength. And uh, the choice of names is actually based. I tried to come up with the typical Swedish names, and uh, these are what two of, of my friends are called. But then I arrived in Gothenburg, and people told me they've never heard about the name Kelda. <laughs> I thought it's a nice name, so let's just stick with it. Um, so Emma right there is dreaming of buying a house for herself and her family. And Kelda, her friend from high school, happens to own a construction business and would be happy to build her a house. Hence uh, that thing which is supposed to be a hammer, not an axe. Um, <laughs> however, it would cost one million krona. Cheap, right? I guess uh, it's a real bargain. But even though Emma has a safe and well-paying job, she has no savings and also no rich uncle to turn to. So what does Emma do? Well, as a long-standing customer of a bank, uh, she goes to the bank and asks if she could get a loan. And the bank, checking that she's sufficiently creditworthy, and that the construction plan for the house looks sound, is happy to extend a loan to her. But where does A Bank get the money from uh, to, to lend to Emma? So I suppose most of the people in, in this room, and also a surprising number of economists, will intuitively answer well, from the savings that other people have deposited at the bank before. But if that was true, where did these deposits initially come from? They must have been created at one point. And here's the key. Commercial banks don't need any deposits to extend a loan. And likewise, an economy as a whole does not necessarily need savings to undertake investments. This might strike you as odd. Where then does the money come from? And the answer in short is from the banks themselves. In order to illustrate this point, I want to show you a simple balance sheet of aforementioned A Bank. And for some of you, this might be the first time in your life that you see a balance sheet, and it might not seem too sexy at first. At least that's what I thought when I saw my first balance sheet. But bear with me, this is going to be real awesome. So <laughs> at the beginning of the day, it's 10 a.m., and the balance sheet is still looking pretty sad. Right? A Bank doesn't have any assets and no liabilities either. All it has is essentially a banking license. Now, what happens when A Bank 
extends a loan to Emma. Well, it now has a, a 1 million krona claim on Emma, secured by the house, because if Emma stops repaying the loan, the bank can seize the house. But at the same time, it has credited Emma's bank account with 1 million krona, which now constitute a liability to the bank. Of course, Emma wants to use these 1 million krona to pay Kelda to, to build the house, so she asks a bank to transfer that money to Kelda's bank account. However, Kelda is not a customer of A bank, but of B bank across the road. So what happens is A bank transfers the money to Kelda's bank account at B bank, where it likewise shows up as a liability on the far right side. But now it's 3 p.m. in the afternoon, and the managers at A bank are freaking out a little bit, because as you can tell, the balance sheet isn't balanced, and that's the definition of a balance sheet. You know, it's got to be balanced at the end of the day. So what to do? Incidentally, B Bank happens to sit on 1 million krona in deposits, and since, since it senses a business opportunity, it's happy to uh, loan 1 million krona to A Bank. And this is at the end of the day, everybody's happy. 1 million krona were created in broad money. And likewise, the economy grew by 1 million krona. So this whole thing illustrates the cycle. Uh, to, to provide some visualization. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's plenty of productive investment opportunities in an economy, such as investments into research to get startups off the ground or to upgrade existing factories. On the public side, investments into infrastructure and education promise a high rate of return for governments, especially in the current low interest rate environment. And every time a loan is extended for such a project, broad money is created out of thin air, but an expectation of the future income that these investments will yield. Naturally, there are bad investments and loans that should not be granted because they have a high probability of not being repaid in the future. And it's the bank's task to monitor those loans in order to avoid running into issues of debt sustainability further down the road. Uh, the real estate market in the US before the crash in 2008 is a case in point. So we must be careful to distinguish between good and bad debt, and not condemn debt as such. Because without the creation of debt, there wouldn't be any creation of money, or any economic progress for that matter. Just to let that sink in. So whether newly created money is beneficial to an economy depends on what it is used for. Now you might say, hold up, this all sounds too simple. Aren't there any regulatory requirements that banks face? And what's the role of the central bank in all of this? And you're absolutely right. Which brings me to the second part of my talk. So in order to illustrate this point, I want to show you a simple, highly simplified central bank balance sheet. I'm going to promise this is the last balance sheet you're going to see for the day. So central banks are essentially banks for the banks. Right, so what commercial banks can do is they can borrow money from the central bank. Why would they do it? They have to fulfill minimum reserve requirements, which shows up as a liability for the central bank. Or in the above uh, mentioned example, if B bank wouldn't have been willing to lend to A bank, A bank could have gone to the central bank to borrow money. Now, in order to do so, commercial banks have to provide the central bank with a security, so-called collateral, such as the loan to Emma. Moreover, commercial banks can obtain so-called central bank money, which is different from broad money, from the central bank and deposit it as so-called excess reserves on the liability side of the central bank balance sheet. And why is that important? Because when a commercial bank has those reserves at the central bank, it can convert them into cash. So it's important to note here that the central bank doesn't just print cash and spread it out, but the central bank provides cash if it is requested by commercial banks, and only if commercial banks have reserves at the central bank. So why is that important? Because during normal times, the central bank can steer the supply and demand for loans by changing the interest rate it charges on those loans, and it pays on those reserves. However, central banks cannot create or print money, contrary to what's frequently claimed by the media. So it's important to note that only commercial banks can create broad money that can be used to invest and consume. Now you might 
say, you a lot of you thinking, this is, has all been interesting as an intellectual exercise and all, but why should I care? If it works well, and you know, it tends to work well during normal times, what does it have to do with me? Because this neat mechanism con can collapse. In an economic downturn, demand for loans plummets because households are uncertain about the future and s scale down their consumption. In response to that, companies may be reluctant to invest because they are afraid they won't be able to sell their products in the future and recoup their investment. Now, if everybody's doing that, if, er if firms, the government, and you, the people, are all prefer saving over investing, a process called deleveraging, then the central bank would have to lower the interest rate far below zero in order to bring the economy back to a state where it is operating at full potential. However, there's a small problem with that, because central banks can't lower the interest rate much below zero, since you and the banks can simply withdraw cash or request it from the central bank, which carries an interest rate of zero by definition. And this is a problem. Let me show you why this is a problem by using um, a chart uh, or two charts that illustrate the macroeconomic implications of this. So over the past few years, uh, domestic demand, which is investment and consumption, has declined dramatically in the euro area, depressing growth and putting people out of work. This is reflected in the euro area's unemployment rate, which at 11% is much higher than in other advanced economies, such as the United States or Sweden. In some countries, such as Spain or Greece, it's even higher still, at more than 20%. Part of the reason for that is that in the euro area, governments have been unwilling, reluctant, or uh, simply not able to provide fiscal support to the economy through, for example, higher public investments or reductions in tax rates. So the ECB has responded by cutting interest rates because inflation has also fallen, continuously trending downwards and is now far below its inflation target of 2%. Why is that important? Because having small but positive inflation uh, is required for a number of reasons. Because once you have falling prices, that is deflation, firms and consumers are even more reluctant to spend and invest, and the burden of that is getting harder and harder to service. So the central bank now is facing this dilemma of being at the zero lower bound. And it has tried various unconventional measures, such as the purchase of government bonds, but that has not decisively lifted growth or inflation because purchasing government bonds creates central bank money, but not broad money that can be used for investment and consumption. Now, this, as I told you and hopefully try to explain, the central bank can always limit the supply of money and inflation, but it's very hard to boost the money supply when inflation and interest rates have fallen to very low levels. So could this be the end of the road? What if there were two ways forward that have not been tried yet? And uh, you might be very familiar with the first one, and that is uh, abandoned cash, which brings us back to the, to the beginning. Or to be more precise, abandoned large denomination banknotes. So Sweden has generally been known for being ahead of the curve when it comes to societal progress and adopting new technologies. I'm not getting paid to say this, by the way. Uh, <laughs> So it's no wonder that cash is barely used here anymore. And that's good, because if an economy doesn't have large bills, the central bank can actually set negative interest rates. Why? Because it's very hard to withdraw millions of krona and keep them as 20 krona bills under your mattress. Actually, this would require several rooms and probably also quite an amount of expensive security measures. Additionally, abandoning large bills carries the great benefit of making activities that are harmful to a society, such as drug trade, human trafficking, or tax evasion, much more difficult, because all these activities are conducted in, in cash. Maybe some of you have seen a, a raid on a Mexican drug dealer on TV, and usually what the police discovers is huge stacks of cash, mainly 500 euro bills and $100 notes. Unfortunately, many European countries, uh, not least my home country of Germany, there's probably going to be quite an amount of resistance against abandoning cash, largely for sentimental reasons, because if we're honest, who's ever used a 500 euro bill to pay for anything, at least for legal purposes? <laughs> so, 
it doesn't seem like a feasible option for now, although I'm an optimist and look forward to the day when my grandkids will ask me in the museum, hey, Grandpa, what's, what's this thing called cash, and why does it have Mr. Nielsen on it? <laughs> but there may be another way forward which doesn't involve getting rid of cash yet. And that has to do with that little box over there. Or, to be more precise, with uh, what's inside this box. A toy helicopter uh, with some money attached to it. Now you might be wondering, what in the world has a toy helicopter to do with monetary policy? So let me explain. What if we allow the central bank to create money through outright transfers to households? Wouldn't that be nice? 5,000 kroner for everyone that you can spend on whatever you like and help the economy along the way? Just like a helicopter flying over land, distributing the money, although in a modern economy, it would stra land straight in your bank account. But that doesn't seem right. Can the central bank simply create 5,000 kroner out of thin air without any asset to show for? It can. And it can do so because it's the only actor in the entire economy that cannot become insolvent or bankrupt by definition, in the sense that, for example, a commercial bank or a company could. Theoretically, a central bank can carry over a loss, a so-called negative equity position, indefinitely. Well, why then don't central banks do this? Now, during normal times, when the economy is operating at full potential, such a creation of money would simply lead to inflation, because if the economy can't produce any more goods and services, if there's more money in the economy, prices are going to rise. Moreover, there's the concern that if such an operation is perceived as somehow imprudent by the public, who tends to be not so familiar with how special a central bank balance sheet is, it might impinge on the central bank's ability to fulfill its mandate of achieving price stability. However, such an operation should therefore be only considered under exceptional circumstances. That is, when interest rates and inflation have fallen uh, a lot and are far below their target, and there's considerable slack in, in the economy, that is, spare capacity. In such a scenario, which is arguably the case right now in many European countries, the transfer from the, from the central bank to households could increase purchasing power, jumpstart economic growth, and achieve price stability on the way. Originally thought up by famous economist Milton Friedman in the 1960s under the fitting term helicopter money, this concept has long laid dormant because these conditions have just not been in place. It has been rekindled, though, by Ben Bernanke, the former chairman of the Federal Reserve, the central bank of the United States, and has gained considerable attention among economists. And after I got that toy helicopter, I can fully understand why. Don't ask me where I got it from. Uh, the kid in Frankfurt is really unhappy now. <laughs> But before I go off the stage and finally get to play with this thing, let me summarize. First, commercial banks create money, the central bank doesn't. Second, this may be a problem when interest rates and inflation have fallen to very low levels and economic activity is weak. And third, there may be ways forward that haven't been explored yet, such as abandoning large bills or outright transfers from the central bank to households. Outright transfers from the central bank to households would constitute a novel policy instrument for central banks and advanced economies. Therefore, there's very little experience to draw on, and any such operation would have to be carefully calibrated and communicated. But while the discussion about putting the central bank back in the driver's seat of money creation should carefully weigh the pros and cons, it is an exciting discussion worth having. <laughs>